The next cranial nerve is seven, which is known as the facial nerve. The facial nerve has actually a motor division and a sensory division. The motor division is the one that supplies the muscles of facial expression. So when we smile, we, we, we grit our teeth, whatever, it's one facial nerve that is supplying all these muscles of facial expression. And when you have a lesion of, let's say, the facial nerve, which has it, uh, runs from somewhere in an intracranial course to come and pass through somewhere near the ear to come and supply all these muscles, then one side of the face becomes weak. And what we get is what we call a symmetry of the face. So you look at the child's face and there's a symmetry, just like in the previous child that you saw with a real actual facial nerve lesion. So there's loss of what we call the nasolabial fold. Everyone has this fold here, which we call a nasolabial fold. And if there's a facial nerve lesion on this side, then this fold disappears. So there's a loss of the nasolabial fold. There is drooping, drooping mouth that you see on one side of the face or drooping of the corner of the mouth, as I'll put it. And then there could be drooling of the affected side. So these are all sides of a facial nerve. If it's not readily obvious, then we just go through three maneuvers that we ask the child to raise his eyebrow. So, Pacho, Chesi, Chesu, say, Mami. Chesu. Chesu, say. So you can raise your eyebrows. That can be seen sometimes. If it's another child, you probably will see wrinkling. So this child is able to do that. Then you can ask the child to squeeze his eyes. Katawani din din din, mami, why I say it, yeah? Katawani din din din, din din katawani. So he's able to squeeze the eyes. It means all the facial muscles are working. And, and the facial nerve also supplies muscles which close the eyes. So and these are the ones too that make a child smile. So the other thing is bewani, we can ask the child to smile. So if the child is able to smile and show all the teeth, then it means all the facial muscles are working. And if there is obvious a symmetry in all of that, then we can also say that there is a facial nerve lesion or problem. Now, great confusion sometimes surrounds the facial nerve and its lesions for students, but it's really quite simple. If it's what we call a lower motor neuron lesion, then anywhere, that means anywhere along the facial nerve to its nucleus or whatever, including the facial nerve from the brainstem has been affected, then the whole of this side of the face becomes weak if it's a lower motor neuron lesion. If it is an upper motor neuron lesion, that's usually due to a tumor somewhere in the brain or a vascular accident like you get in a stroke. Then, because there's what we call bilateral innervation of the upper muscles here, this child will lose the ability to wrinkle if it's coming from a higher cause. So, we can ask the child like we did earlier to produce a wrinkle for us and then we can tell whether there is an upper motor neuron lesion or a lower motor neuron lesion. Um, when it's an upper motor neuron, the child is still able to produce a wrinkle because if the facial nerve has a bilateral innervation here, so that ability is not lost. The commonest commonest cause for a facial palsy in children is actually Bell's palsy, which is an idiopathic cause where we do not know the cause, as we'll put it. And that is a lower motor neuron lesion, which typically develops over hours in children. And basically you see that the mouth is drawn to the opposite side. The, the healthy side, the mouth is drawn to that side. And a, a lot of students wrongly attribute the lesion to that side. But when the healthy side is working, then it pulls the mouth to that side because it is actually working. And that's how come you see one side distorted. But the lesion will actually be on the opposite side. Sensory testing is not necessary at this stage. But you can offer to test sensation since the facial nerve also supplies some sensation to the, to the face. The next nerve is the eighth nerve, which is known as the auditory nerve. Most students are not expected to test this nerve routinely, but in, in clinical practice, it, it is worth testing. The eighth nerve can easily be tested one just by hearing. We can do what we call the Weber's or Rhinus test, 
which you can actually do in the clinic and that's really a test of hearing and then we can also um, do other tests of um, the vestibular cochlear function so these are tests that I will not go into now the ninth nerve is quite easy to test we can ask the child that's the glossopharyngeal nerve just to say 9th, 10th, 11th these are nerves that we easily say if a child can actually swallow without difficulty we don't really have problems with that nerve so if you say the child say ah ah say kahama ah chemi we try to look deep down the palate to see how the ovula is behaving and these are usually tests of normal function of the 9th, 10th nerves 11th nerve we can ask the child to shrug the shoulders like this, push it up against my shoulders whilst I push hard, and that's a good test of the 11th nerve. That's the trapezius. 12th nerve is the hypoglossal nerve, very easy to test. Ask the child to protrude the tongue. Our tongue brow say, Hey, you say, a Good girl. So we look at this. If there's a 12th nerve division, there may be ipsilateral atrophy. That's this part of the tongue may not be as well developed as this side. Or the tongue deviates to one side and that's very easy to pick as a 12 nerve. So hopefully we've gone through all the cranial nerves in a very simple fashion.